Why don't behavioral approaches work for pathologically demand avoidant children and teens? So today I'm gonna to answer this question and I'm gonna get really dorky with you and we're going to break down the two different lenses that we can view our children through. One through a behavioral lens and we're gonna break down all the logic of that approach from a place of neutrality and objectivity. And then we're gonna look through the same type of behavior and the same situation through the PDA lens and discern the differences, right? So we're going to the very root of where parents, therapists, teachers, partners who aren't lead parents get stuck so that we can start to see these children and how to help them through a completely different lens, okay? So I'm gonna do three things. I'm gonna explain the different logics as lenses that we can take on and off. I'm going to talk, second, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about why I feel comfortable doing this and examples from my previous life as a doctoral researcher in political science. And don't worry, I'm gonna link it so you understand what has to do with what. And then third, we're gonna round out today with three real life examples. So I'm gonna use two anonymized examples from parents I've worked with directly in the Paradigm Shift program and one from my own life. Okay, so I hope this is helpful to really get granular and break things down, okay? Okay, so let's first talk about what is a behavioral approach? What do we mean when we say that? And I really wanna approach this from a place of neutrality and objectivity of like not right or wrong, but just what's the right fit for your particular child? Because for some children, I actually think a more behavioral approach may be the appropriate lens, right? But that's for you to decide. We're just going to look at these as options. Okay, so first, from the perspective of a behavioral approach, we want to recognize the assumptions. So the first assumption is that our child or our teen or our spouse or ourselves <laughs> are operating from the frontal lobe or the prefrontal cortex of the brain. That's the thinking part of the brain. That's where we can have rational thoughts, understand cause and effect, access empathy, connection. It's our most evolved part of the brain. It's rational, it's conscious, okay? So when we think about behavioral approaches, we're assuming our kid is operating from that part of the brain and that they have control. They are rationally thinking through whatever their behavior it is, whether it is um, refusing to buckle their seatbelt or swearing at you or um, destroying their siblings' things or tearing the leaves off your plants, okay? So through the lens of behavior, behavioral approaches, we're thinking about those behaviors as motivated by the following deep why. There's a motivation there and it's under the conscious control. They have a need that they're trying to get met, right? It could be attention, it could be that they want to get their way, they wanna be in control, they wanna be the authority. So through a behavioral lens, we're assuming that there is a conscious awareness and a motivation for the behavior, okay? so what we do about behavior through that lens is gonna be a series of incentives and disincentives and trying to teach the child or person not to do that behavior. We're assuming that they're operating from the part of their brain, the frontal lobe or the prefrontal, prefrontal cortex, that we can teach them not to do it through a series of incentives and disincentives or direct teaching, right? And through that lens, we, we need to be consistent and it needs to be not fluctuating, okay? So for example, you know, if a child refuses to put on their shoes in the morning, the behavioral approach would be, even if it's subtle, incentives, disincentives are trying to teach. So an incentive might be, you know, if you get your shoes on, then you can have Skittles, if you get your shoes on, you can use your iPad in the car. That's an incentive, there's a cause and effect there. 
If it's a disincentive, which can also be termed a consequence or even a punishment in extreme cases, then it might be if you don't put your shoes on, then you lose iPad time later in the day, or I'm going to yell at you, right? That's a disincentive. <laughs> and even if you just do it, that becomes a disincentive. A more subtle way of a behavioral approach would be trying to teach, right? Saying, hey, if you don't get your shoes on, then we're going to be late to school. And then, you know, you're, you're going to miss the circle time that you like, or you know, you're going to get a, another tardy and I know you want to graduate this this spring. And we're trying to teach them, we might even be trying to teach them like how to tie the shoe or put it on, okay? Because we're assuming they're in this part of the brain. We're teaching, we're incentivizing, we're disincentivizing, okay? So what's the long-term goal of a behavioral approach? Often it's like, I can't just let this go. I have to teach them to function in society, they need to be independent, and they need to learn, quote, the rules of the game of modern society, right? And I believe for most people, whether it's a teacher, a therapist, a parent, especially because I was in this place, this comes from a place of love, comes from a place of wanting your child to do well, of wanting the child to succeed, of knowing that the world is a compliance-based, behaviorally driven place that we all live in, okay? So let's take an example, another example, swearing. If we're going through this logic, we're assuming that the swearing is under their conscious control through the behavioral lens. We're thinking they're trying to get a need met or they're trying to manipulate or get control or attention or be the authority. What we do about it is we have incentives, disincentives, or teaching. And the long-term goal is to stop their swearing so that they can function in society and be successful. Okay? <clears throat> the underlying assumption of all of this, which is profound and can even dovetail into like your spiritual and religious beliefs, is the assumption that humans need to be taught to be good. If we don't teach them to be good with incentives, disincentives, and direct explicit teaching, then they will not be good. Okay? The Now we're going to go over to the PDA lens or a non-behavioral lens. And this lens can really support even traumatized or other types of neurodivergent children. But I believe that a behavioral approach to PDA children can never actually work. That's my belief. And I'm going to explain why. Okay, so for a PDA or the part of their brain that is operating when they are doing things like destroying their, their siblings things, swearing at you, refusing things like getting their shoes on, avoiding things, or even going on to into like elopement or you know, screaming, all of those things are driven by this part of the brain, the survival brain and the amygdala, which is our threat detector. And it's coming from a place of neuroception, which is a term coined by Stephen Porges, the father of polyvagal theory. Neuroception just means the pre-perceptual awareness or whether or not our nervous system perceives we're safe, we're in danger, or there's life threat. What defines a PDA brain is that this amygdala and limbic system, or what we can call the survival brain, perceives threat and sometimes life threat anytime there is a neuroception of a loss of autonomy or a loss of equality, okay? So what happens when we're using a behavioral lens? We're putting ourselves in a position of authority, okay? We're putting ourselves in the position of the decider and we're placing limits. And that, if we can just view it not as good or bad, but that is the root cause of the child's nervous system activation, okay? And this is why I don't believe it can actually work, okay? So 
the assumption instead of, oh, this kid is having this behavior because they're motivated and they're trying to, they have a goal, they're seeking this, they're, it's under their conscious control, they're deciding. We can understand it in a similar way to the way we understand a trauma response, which is it's not under their control. It is what their nervous system is doing in response to the subconscious perception of threat. And therefore the body is going off in ways that they don't decide, right? Like you don't get to decide if your body perceives life threat, whether or not you swear at an assailant or whether or not you start to disassociate and go selectively mute if you're being attacked. That is just how the nervous system works. That's how humans' nervous systems work in order to evolutionarily stay alive and not cease to exist as a species. Okay, so if we can wrap our minds around this different assumption, we can start to understand why incentives, disincentives, and teaching in the moment and being consistent with boundaries when the child is essentially having a trauma response is not gonna be helpful for these children or teens or humans. So what can we do about it? It's a different logic. And so the way that I think about it is as a long-term nervous system accommodation-based approach that is motivated by trying to support your child to spend more time in their prefrontal cortex create new neural pathways out of that survival brain and create a window of tolerance so that they're not just their threat response. And what we see is the behavioral expression of a nervous system disability and they get labeled as oppositional defiant disorder, severe ADHD, extreme generalized anxiety, and this potpourri of acronyms, which captures only component pieces of what the root cause actually is. Okay, so through this logic, we have to do things that are very counterintuitive, right? So when the child is swearing at us, we immediately go into our survival response and what do we revert back to? What we know, which is what a behavioral approach is, right? And we're saying, okay, we need to extinguish this behavior. But that's just going to continually escalate because of the root cause of what activates them. So if we can support them through accommodations and de-escalating those moments and not trying to teach in those moments, the more experiences their nervous system has with that, the more window they're gonna have to actually get back to their prefrontal cortex and their heart and who they are. Because I don't believe that no matter, no matter how bad, quote, the behavior that your children have, I believe, that they are good inside and that they you're seeing the threat response and the survival response and not who they are, okay? So that is the assumption that I now work from and I've had to do a lot of, <laughs> a lot of soul searching in my own trauma cave and my life falling apart six years ago. And I learned to see my son differently and now I have a different assumption about behavior and humans. And you may disagree with me, but this is my underlying assumption for all the work that I do and all the parenting that I do. My child is already good. They are a divine expression of humanity and I don't have to teach them to be a good human, right? And that is a very different assumption <laughs> than what I started my life with as a parent. I was like, it's my job to teach them to be a good human. And if I don't, I'm failing as a parent. And this is not only rooted, now I'm going to go a little bit into my background. This is not only rooted in my parenting experience. This is rooted in my academic training as a political scientist, okay? So when I was trained as a political scientist in a doctorate degree at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, my department had a very strong behavioral bend to their discipline, right? So everything was premised on the idea of rational choice, meaning that all 
voters or political actors are operating from their conscious brain and making rational decisions. And we even use behavioral economic models to understand why people do things, right? However, my doctoral dissertation research was in a conflict zone in Colombia and a post-conflict zone where there had been massacres, where there had been severe violence, civil war, sexual violence, okay? And I lived in Colombia for a total of 16 months studying the people's experience on grassroots peace building and what they experienced during the war. And you know what I realized? All of my methodologies, all of my evidence-based strategies, the game theory courses, all, all the assumptions that I had learned through a rational choice model and econometric and behavioral models for how people operate did not really apply, okay? So for example, women who had experienced sexual violence are not gonna answer my survey questions in a group of their community about what happened during the war, right? And they're gonna communicate with nonverbal signals and energy, and I'm gonna be able to read, oh, I shouldn't be asking this question in front of this small community of males, maybe their husband's in the room, right? So we're starting to see that this obsession and and I get it. Like I'm a I'm a researcher. I like observable indicators. I like data. But what I learned through that experience was like, oh, when people are having a trauma response and there's things like trust and social capital and culture and all of these things that we can't measure, some of these methodologies maybe aren't applicable, especially if we have a traumatized population. Okay? So that was my first seed planted of like, there might be another lens through which to view human behavior. And in addition, I took courses in other disciplines, sociology, anthropology, history. My advisor was um, a feminist scholar. And so those lenses are very different than rational choice of like everything is rational, okay? But I also learned to think objectively of like, these are lenses, like there isn't a right way and a wrong way. All of these are tools that we can experiment with and see if it actually supports. Okay, so let's go through the three examples I have just to explain or illustrate what we talked about. Okay, one is from the Paradigm Shift Program course yesterday. I'm going to anonymize it a little bit for this person. Okay, so this mom came on the call and she was asking about what to do when they're out and about in the city where they live and there's all of these little stores, like convenience stores, that have all of these like fun dopamine filled things you can buy, including ice cream. Okay, so she asked me, you know, I've given my child ice cream like three times today, but at the end of the day, we're going to this, we're going to this final um, kiosk or bodega and she's insisting she wants to go in for the ice cream. What should I do? And I say, I don't tell you what to do, but I can help you look through the two lenses and decide for yourself using what I call cost-benefit decision-making, okay? So let's look at this scenario through the behavioral lens and then let's look at it through the PDA lens. Okay, through the behavioral lens, the mom had already said, no, we're not going in the store. So as you guys know, what is the therapist or the coach or whoever it is you're working with or your peers or the grandparent next to you or even your partner gonna say? If you said no, you have to stick to it because if not, they're gonna learn that you're not in control and we have to be consistent to teach the behavior or else they're never gonna learn, okay? And believe me, these voices come up for me as well because we're all conditioned or programmed within this paradigm. This is why I call my signature program the paradigm shift because we're moving out of this particular paradigm and experimenting with a totally different logic. So that was the behavioral logic. And I said, here in this program, we are experimenting with the PDA logic. 
So through the PDA logic, what we see is she had a big nervous system response. Her mom had put a boundary down and then there was a big escalation. And so what we can do is we can look at that as data. Oh, she was really close to her threshold of tolerance for all of this nervous system accumulation. And we realize, oh, she's going into fight flight. This isn't in order to change her mom's behavior or be in control. It's just the perception of threat. So we can take this data and decide, is it worth the cost to her nervous system in this moment of setting the boundary? Because maybe the cost to her nervous system of eating another ice cream is going to give her stomach aches. She's not going to sleep. There's, you know, sugar, etc. But really looking objectively at the cost benefit of the nervous system. And then we can look at the cost benefit of letting her have it. What's the cost and benefit to her nervous system? What's the cost benefit to the mom's nervous system? Okay, and then we can make an objective decision without judgment. It's just what you do in the moment. And through this lens, we have to confront judgment of like, if you back down, quote, end quote, rather than just seeing it as data of how close her nervous system is to her threshold, and then making a cost benefit decision based on that logic. Okay, so this is a very different way of looking at things. And I'm not saying it's the right way for every parent by no means, right? Like, I wouldn't be viewing my life and parenting in this way if I didn't have a PDA kit because it's a very different way of operating, right? Let's take the next example. So I posted about a transition treat. Um, and I got, there was some back and forth about like me being a behaviorist. Okay. So I gave the example of my son having trouble getting into the car. And so we provide a transition treat sometimes for him to have that dopamine hit to distract from the level of activation so he can access school, which he wants to attend. Okay not making him and not incentivizing him. He wants to go and he knows that he doesn't have to go because that is the paradigm shift, right? That was a big one for me. So through a behavioral lens, you're thinking, oh, Casey is incentivizing him with a treat. And if he doesn't get into the car, he doesn't get the treat, right? It's like training and I'm consistent versus me recognizing he needs a dopamine hit to distract from his threat response in order to access something that he wants, okay? And me providing that accommodation whether or not he gets in the car, okay? That's the difference, right? It's a huge paradigm shift. <laughs> Third, this was another question that came up during the paradigm shift program. I give my child praise. So my child is constantly asking me for praise. They're constantly saying, mama, look what I drew. Mama, will you watch what I'm watching? Mama, did you see that I jumped on one foot, etc." right? Constantly needing that one-on-one -on -one undivided attention. But then when the mom sees the child doing something and praises them, they have a nervous system response and start equalizing against the mom and self, meaning like, stop saying that, I'm stupid, that's not, you know, that's not good, I'm a terrible person, etc. So she's like, why is this happening? And this gets at the most subtle root of this difference between the lens, because when she is asking for praise and attention, she has autonomy. She is the decider, she is in control. And what we know about PDA is that that regulates the nervous system and helps the child person stay in their frontal lobe, their prefrontal cortex, the thinking. However, when we are praising PDA children, when they're not expecting it, and with the subtle energy of, and I want you to ask yourself if this is the energy that you might even subconsciously have around the praise is, I'm praising that you are nice to your sibling or I'm praising how well you use like wrote out your handwriting because 
ultimately in the back of my heart and mind, I want you to do it again. And therefore it becomes an incentive and they neurocept this. Okay. Again, I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying the root cause of the child's activation is related to this neuroception. So if we have energy around incentivizing, disincentivizing, trying to teach explicit behavior in the moment in order to change them, there will be a nervous system response because that is the neurobiology of the nervous system disability of PDA. This is my perspective. Okay, and I'm not trying to demonize behavioral approaches. I'm not trying to demonize exposure approaches that may work for an OCD or anxious kid. Personally, I like incentive structures. I like little like adult sticker charts and checking things off the list, etc. That is my lens and nervous system. Okay, everybody is different. But this is the lens that I teach you how to operationalize, meaning how to put it into practice and how to make this shift like on an energetic level. This is what I teach here, but explicitly live with mentorship and support and a like-minded group of families in the Paradigm Shift program. This is what we're working to do to make this paradigm shift on a profound level so that there is an energetic shift and your child starts to neurocept a different level of felt safety which will i believe shift things dramatically in a positive direction for your child's mental health physical and mental well-being and the relationship and connection with you and your life okay because you are the catalyst. That is also my perspective. And we work on changing your approach, behavior, and lens as a catalyst for your family. Okay, so if you are interested in joining us for the next cohort of the Paradigm Shift program, enrollment does open August 5th, and we will start September 4th. And if you want, you can drop a PSP comment below and we will send you the link. Okay, I'm gonna go through and just see if there's any questions I missed. Um, and if anything was confusing about that presentation, feel free to drop a question. I need this live so much, but to leave to do a school run, is there any way it can be shared? Yes. So all of my lives, I keep on the tiles and then I also put them on YouTube so you can share them with a link. And then I eventually turn them into a podcast episode that is edited. So many, many ways you can access the information. You're so welcome. James, I'm sorry you're having intrusive thoughts. That's something that I have struggled with as well. But again, this isn't to blame any anybody. It's just a different lens that you can experiment with to understand a new way, a different way. And for people who are really stuck, even if it feels overwhelming, the understanding that there is something we can do that's different can be really a consolation. I know it was for me when I felt like there's nothing I can do, right? Like my whole life is falling apart and my kid is a feral animal and like nobody can help me, right? Does it have to be conscious to be behavioral? Well, okay, so the way I think about it, and again, like sometimes your child's behavior is going to be conscious and motivated, <laughs> because they're human, right? But I like to put on a, a lens in order to shift my approach to my child so that we can shift our relationship and the peace in our home. And it has really supported them. So I always encourage parents not to try and decipher, like, is this motivated or is this not when they're starting to experiment with the lens? but rather treat everything like a nervous system response and 
as you shift the paradigm, observe what changes in your relationship, in their access to basic needs, and in their nervous system activation. So are the meltdowns reducing? Are the shutdowns reducing? Are they increasingly able to access eating or sleeping or toileting independence, whatever it is? And what are the indicators of the connection to you, right? So it's like an experiment. And as you get more used to a new paradigm, it's a lens, so you can take it off, you can put it on, right? So now there are occasions, now that I've been doing this for five years, where I make the assumption that, oh, I'm gonna correct this behavior in this moment because it's not appropriate and I know that my son's nervous system can withstand the correction. But that couldn't have been my behavior two years ago without rupturing those tenuous trust we were building, which for me, my my perspective is the currency for all future like mentorship relationships, collaborate, collaborative problem solving, and some of the other cool tools that you can use with these kids. Yeah. I'm sorry if I froze. Yeah, this is a very good approach to people are good. Yeah. That's my perspective. And sometimes it's tested, especially on social media, let me tell you. But, you know, when I'm in a place of regulation, I can access that compassion. <laughs> uh, yes, it will be on YouTube later. These souls are here to explore the world, not be trapped. Yeah. Behavioral approaches is what changes the brain. Yeah, no, I agree with that, but we don't want it to change in the direction of severe complex trauma, which is what I think happens with these kids. Yeah, I mean, for a neurotypical kid, it can change the brain in a good direction. For a pda -er, my belief is that, like, doubling down on a behavioral approach causes trauma, and that does change the brain and the body. <laughs> um, and I say that without judgment right? Like my parenting traumatized my son. He has trauma around eating because of the behavioral approaches I used, right? And I can own that and also be compassionate with myself because as we talked about, all of us are conditioned, trained, programmed to think through the behavioral and rational lens for human behavior. I did a doctorate in it. In it. So like, Ultimately, we have to forgive ourselves for, you know, forgive ourselves for doing what we're told and doing what we think is the right thing out of love for our children at the time, right? And it's really hard to go against societal conventional wisdom. If you do these approaches, is everyday life much less turbulent yeah but it's very long term right like my life looks nothing like it did five years ago in a good way but my life is also more constrained because I've made a lot of decisions reflective of the fact that my child has a nervous system disability right but like I used to not even eat be able to eat or go to the bathroom because of the level of equalizing and like we had to split our kids for three years including like Christmas and vacations because of the level of violence against the sibling and you know things have dramatically changed but it's a long-term approach and I don't have quick fixes in the moment because it's a trauma response and and I don't have a way to fix a nervous system disability yeah. Okay. Yeah, agency for these kids is everything. Energy. I'm a scientist myself and the behavioral approach doesn't work here. It's scary because we need to change to feelings and the logic is very different. Absolutely. But if you're a scientist, like, you know that there's different epistemological underpinnings and assumptions to different disciplines, right? If you're a physicist talking to a biologist, talking to a chemist, talking to, you know, a neuroscientist, you're all going to have different underlying assumptions, methodologies, all of it. So, like, if you put your science cap on, we can start to see this as, like, a not a normative thing of, like, 
it's not good or bad. It's just what works and how we can view the reality right in front of us, right? Oh, so I see a couple. Oh, shoot. You guys are commenting PSP. So I lose the chat when I go off of <laughs> the live. So I'm going to ask you to drop it in the comments. Yeah. Okay, guys, thanks so much. I think I saw somebody ask me if I'm PDA. I do not believe I'm PDA, but I have panic disorder and I've been diagnosed with like OCD and severe anxiety, but the root cause is not related to my neuroception of autonomy and equality. And that's how I distinguish it because, you know, you can have a trauma response to sensory input if you're autistic. Like it doesn't have to be the same root cause to have that nervous system response. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Okay, my friends. Oh, I see Maz Jitsu. So I'm going to upload this onto the tile. And so if you can comment below the tile once I save this video, that's where I'll see the PSPs. Okay, thank you so much, guys. It was so fun to be with you. Bye.